All right, this absenteeism situation in Providence, we'll get a perspective tonight. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Yeah, so you've heard a lot about absenteeism in the, in the public schools in Rhode Island in general. Providence is, you know, in a little bit of tumult over the latest numbers. Administrators are talking about penalties for teachers and the like, but I think it's always important that we check in with the teachers and the representatives to talk about what the realities are on the ground. And so the president of the Providence Teachers Union, Mary Beth Calabro, is here this evening to talk to us about that, and we'll get to her uh, momentarily. But I'm sure if there's a day that we could excuse the teachers for being absent, it would be today, 60 degrees. Is there anybody who didn't want to play some hooky? And, of course, you don't get better weather than this for that. Tom Brady, you know, with six fingers up. You get that? You get all that? So a little, we got a little duck boat video here from this morning's activity, you know, more than a million people. And again, you know, I, I dwell in Patriots Nation as a desperate giant fan waiting for this to come our way again sometime, but nobody has more fun than Gronk. Oh my goodness, uh, great stuff. Can I, just, uh, can I just say this we are still here thing? You know, Brady said it when he left. It was it was right for the moment, but it's a really cheesy cliche. Can you guys get something new? You know, we're still here. Stop. Stop. Anyway, congratulations to Patriots Nation. Um, the thrill of victory continues. Um, if you're watching at 7.30, you're getting ready for the president tonight. If you're watching this at midnight, you've seen the president tonight, maybe. Uh, we will spend a couple of days analyzing the State of the Union, but uh, if you're watching early, here's some of the preview and the concept, I, I literally have to laugh out loud when I hear the word unity. President Trump is expected to call for unity as he speaks to a divided Congress tonight during his second State of the Union address. A looming question is just how many falsehoods, distortions, and made up facts will appear in the president's speech. The president and Democrats have remained at odds over border wall funding, a $5.7 billion sticking point that caused the recent 35-day government shutdown. We're going to have a strong border, and the only way you have a strong border is you need a physical barrier, you need a wall. Lawmakers have just 10 days to strike a deal and avert another shutdown. Aides to President Trump say he'll preach bipartisanship at tonight's speech. You're also going to see the president call on Congress and say, look, we can either work together and get great things done, or we can fight each other and get nothing done. And delivering the Democratic response to President Trump's speech will be Stacey Abrams, who narrowly lost her bid to become Georgia's first black governor. You know, look, you know, unity is not a new concept for State of the Union addresses, but, you know, I have to laugh out loud over the idea that the president's going to come up with that with that concept. Uh, anything he has done in this direction has been a miserable underperformance. And so the thing about the president, it seems, is that he just doesn't even understand uh, his role in, in terms of this divide that we have. But we'll see. Uh, it's all going to be about the deals that they make, not the rhetoric that they spew, right? Anybody on, on either side of the aisle at this point. Um, this is an interesting story coming back here at home. Target 12 put this together. Uh, Tim White, for the last handful of years, has been chronicling this $100,000 club. This is the, for some reason, the, I, I think we just have a cultural fixation on the, on, on the six-figure term, right? Uh, and so it has definitely, in the last four years, grown exponentially. 21% uh, growth in the number of people, uh, public employees in the state, who are making $100,000 or more. Uh, it may surprise you, you know, I've long been kind of looked upon as a government watchdog type. I have never been bothered by that compensation. In fact, I've never been, I'd like to see teachers make that kind of money on a regular basis. I think the accountability ought to come along with it, and I think we need to restructure all of that. Um, there are some real hard jobs in, in, in public employee, and I don't get too worried about the idea that somebody's making $100,000. The truth of the matter is, is that 100 grand these days ain't what it used to be. Uh, things are expensive. Here's where I do think we have something to talk about, though. When Tim digs into the correctional officers and finds 
that some of them are like a base salary of 70 or 80, but they're making 240, 250, 260 because of the overtime that they put in. Uh, I don't begrudge hardworking people for making good money, and I understand that there's some structural issues, and they haven't hired new correctional officers for a while, so overtime is plentiful. Uh, but that cannot be healthy. I, I, I'm not worried about the, 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 the revenue that they make, the, the income that they drive, but the hours that they're putting. And you learn from Tim's work that the maximum is four shifts in a row without sleeping. Uh, what? That's a dangerous job. We got to talk to the warden about this. She's brand new and she's really smart. So we'll, uh, we'll follow up on that coming up. Uh, in the meantime, this Kicking You at Middle School is, is in the middle of a real Donnybrook here. And a story in the Providence Journal on the front page today kind of intrigued me. I'm not exactly sure what generated it other than a follow-up from last week. This is, a, this is the place where middle school teachers uh, walked out. Well, didn't walk out because they never walked in. They had a sick out and admitted it. Uh, based on mental health needs because of the challenges they have with discipline there. And it's obviously a grind between the administration and and the teachers there. Now parents are getting into the mix. And this front page story in the journal is chock full of, of, of comments where parents are suggesting that the administration there is not doing their jobs. They side with the teachers. And as a, as a, as a parent who paid a close attention to what happened in the dynamic of those relationships with my own kid, I see parents generally will side with teachers right away because teachers are in are, are, are their custodial helpers. You know, we send kids to school for six, seven hours a day. We want to make sure teachers are are feeling our support. Here's what you really can do to support teachers. Hold your kids accountable. And one of the things that the administration I think there needs to do but quick is to have a community meeting and bring the parents in and start talking about these dynamics and get a consensus that there's going to be a different sheriff in town if things don't change. Now, we don't have expulsion opportunities rampant. And, you know, Mary Beth probably can talk about that, too. There are some disciplinary prohibitions that kind of make it difficult to rule the roost, you know. Uh, so I'm not sure that the playing field is set for a real resolve on this stuff, other than when parents come in and say, you know what, we own this, and we want to take responsibility for this. Uh, Finger pointing between teachers and principals and superintendents, I'm not sure is really healthy. In the meantime, uh, on this issue of teachers p potentially being disciplined in Providence, one of the WPRI headlines uh, talks to that. When can I kind of break this down? Some of the numbers are disputed. And, you know, I keep going back to the condition of the schools, to be honest with you. Uh, it's not that healthy. No. Not that healthy. Welcome. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for um, having me. Did you have a thought, not that this is your domain, I mean, you got enough to do in Providence, but the, uh, what I had to say about the kicking you at middle school, it, parental, parental responsibility is huge in keeping the peace, isn't it? It is, it, and we like to be partners with our parents. We, we appreciate the parents coming to our assistance. Um, but as I said before, um, when I spoke about this, and, and I'm not there. So this is not Providence. This right. is Kickamuit. But I, I think that the stretch could be made to Providence in that I find that because of certain parameters that have been put on suspensions and the attachment of suspension data to overall um, quality of schooling data by ride, I think that the majority of administrations are trying to keep the numbers low so that that's not yet another black mark on the overall effectiveness rating of their school and so that leads to um, you know teachers feeling unsupported in terms of discipline. In other words you calculate the success of a school in part by the disciplinary tone. Correct. Suspensions will indicate well, it could be a true indicator of, of disciplinary tone. If you have too many suspensions, it's a black mark, so Correct. you keep it. So you try to handle your business inside without having to do that. Correct. I, I'm not sure about why suspension ought to be considered a negative mark. I mean, if if you gotta if you gotta keep if you gotta keep discipline. Well, I, I, I think the, the, the premise of it is that we need to keep kids in school in order to be able to teach them. 
Um, and although that is true, I think that if we're not going to out of school suspend, then we need to find alternatives by which students um, have consequences for certain behaviors. Um, I've, I'm on the record in, in Providence at the school board for saying that we're not doing our children any favors by letting them believe that there are no consequences to behaviors. So, um, and there's that, 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 that expulsion stick isn't even there. Right? I mean, expelling a kid is really, really, really tough. Egregious. It would have to be something significantly egregious. Violent, really Very violent. Very violent. Yeah. Not just the first time, et cetera. So I believe the pendulum has swung. We used to have zero tolerance, so that basically meant that if you brought so much as um, a play water gun to school, yeah. that you would be suspended for 10 days automatically. That was dumb. Which was ridiculous, right? So that we had that sh way. And now we've come to this way where hardly anything gets you suspended. What we need to do is come back to a, a simple middle ground where we need to be rational, reasonable human beings and find that if in the real world, if we were 18 years old and we did these behaviors in public, like I said you know, at school board, I said if me, Mary Beth Calabro, walked down Chalkstone Avenue and walked up to you, Dan York, and punched you in the face, I expect to be arrested, and I expect there to be a consequence for that behavior. Um, that's not what's happening. So what are we teaching kids but that there is no consequence? But then the reality is when they do go out into the real world and they do randomly or decide that they have a, a problem with someone, go out and punch somebody, when there is a consequence, then they, they don't know what to do. And then, then we have all of these kids going into prison for ridiculous things. And so I, I think that we need to have a whole community, district, legislator, ride conversation about what does this look like? Because everybody's talking about restorative practices, but no one has supported districts, teachers, and students or families with the money and the, the training and the information to say, what does that look like? What does that look like in a school? And how, not one of my teachers in my building has been trained in restorative practices, but we toss the word around a lot. Yeah, when we come back, we'll actually define it because I'm sure none of you know what it means. <laughs> I think you probably have an understanding, sort of. Stay with us. <laughs> Uh, the mayor uh, of Providence talking about the disturbing trend of absenteeism in the Providence schools. But let me, uh, let me pick up where Mary Beth and I left off in the last segment, talking about restorative practices, mm -hmm. restoring mm -hmm. good quality environment, I'm guessing, yes. is, is what restorative practices mm -hmm. are. Uh, teachers, administrators get into this vernacular. I'm not sure the parents are actually up to date with the changing vernaculars all the time. And this is one of the things I find you know, somewhat disturbing about education in general, and that is that the divide really is not just between sometimes teachers and administration, it's between educators and non-educated, mm -hmm. don't you think? Correct. The, 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 the parental community mm -hmm. uh, and those who do get involved are, are well-meaning, but still sometimes not able to really make a good evaluation. Yeah. I think we need to trust the expertise of teachers on a whole bigger level. Have teachers feel better about the respect that they're that, that they're given. You guys need to do more public outreach like today on a non, you know, salary mm -hmm. argument contract point of view and develop a more conversive atmosphere. I, I, I agree with you. I think that um, I think that we need to do a better job uh, in education um, in terms of including and being inclusive of not just families but in, in the community in general so that there is an, um, a general understanding because, you know, EduSpeak isn't for everybody. EduSpeak. Right, and so sometimes when we have conversations in um, meetings for special education services, we start talking about testing and we start talking about all these, you know, five dollar, fifty dollar, hundred dollar words, and these parents, um, you know, don't necessarily understand all the things we're talking about, and some of the time, 
it gets lost in, in the minutiae of the, what we're talking about rather than talking about the child themselves. So I think that we as a community, as an educational community, need to do a better job of communicating what we're doing right. with parents. So given that, uh, what is the current tone of the Providence Teacher Union's relationship with the, the school administration and the city administration right now? I mean, you got a deal, right? So that's done. We have a deal. Um, it was somewhat acrimonious. Uh, I thought. Mm -hmm. I thought actually the mayor uh, offered some really disingenuous answers in terms of his approach to the negotiation. I kind of dug in on him a little bit, and and uh, his answers seemed to be um, kind of like chasing a chicken. You know, I, I was, I was, <laughs> I found it frustrating. I'm sure you're not going to dump on him here. You got your deal, so you know, yeah, you know, all's fair in love and war and timing. Mm -hmm. But it's the relationship. A working one right now. Do you feel between the superintendent and the and, and the mayor that you're in a problem-solving mode? I, I well, so to be f frank, we we never had a problem with the superintendent or or the district. We've always had a working relationship with the district, mm -hmm. and so that relationship was never um, impacted adversely through the whole negotiations process. It's a weird schematic, though, in Providence, though, because it? the superintendent reports more or less to this board, which which is appointed by the mayor, and so the connection mm -hmm. is like this. The, it you is. Know, I, I think we need l more connectivity across the state between city and town governments and school governance. Mm -hmm. But in Providence, I think it's almost too much. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? To some extent. And, but as an educational leader, um, Superintendent Marr and um, the teaching and learning team and I have created this relationship that is extremely collaborative. And so we kind of um, shielded ourselves from that kind of, you know, the minutia of contract negotiations. He stayed out of that. He did. Yeah. He, re he really did. He's and, a sharp guy. And, yeah, and, and because we know what the work is, and, and the work's not going to happen overnight, and it wouldn't have happened had I started saying, well, we're not going to do this during the day, and we're not going to do that during the day, and we're not going to help you with this. That, that's not what we wanted to do was to to have a conversation with the mayor and not impact teaching and learning during the school day and so that was the conversations that we were having so we kept with the coaching we kept with um, doing the the um, the college application there wasn't um, a work to rule disposition did you work to rule we, we there was we did like a work to rule light to light. be honest with you we, we I mean so we we started work to rule, and then unfortunately, um, William Possons was murdered on the second day of school. Hmm. So we um, we stopped work to rule immediately. Right, that's right. Okay. So that we could have teachers and counselors and yeah. everyone go to those schools to support each other, support the kids, yeah. um, to be there for each other. So that was you know we stopped that. When when we started back in with work to rule, um, then the bus strike happened. So we still had teachers staying after school to make sure kids got on buses, to make sure that kids got with the parents. So at the end of the day, you know, the teachers they care about kids, right? So absolutely. Somebody can't sit absolutely. there and say, "Sorry, I'm, I'm working to the contract, yeah. and I'm not doing anything outside the contract," which is what work to rule is. In case you, you, you're not right. up to date on that. Uh, all right, we got to get into this absenteeism thing, though. The superintendent is being public about his concerns. I think mm -hmm. the president of the union has been frank about it. Let's mm -hmm. uh, talk about that when we come back. Stay with us. I'm finding that we could talk about education issues broadly all day long, and uh, I eat this stuff up. And you know what? Our research finds that uh, people are really in tune with this stuff, and and, want, and, and really are have an insatiable ap appetite, really, about about education matters. This absenteeism uh, data is uh, something that certainly opens your eyes. Uh, put this chart up if we can. Um, what, what do you think about these numbers? I mean, the, the Friday-Monday absentee rate being higher than the middays is what I think most people look at and say, okay, what's mm -hmm. going on there? We only have a few minutes, but what's your thought about that? So when I looked at the absentee data t in general, um, you know, my first response to it was I'd like to see it disaggregated. I'd like to see it disaggregated by school. I'd like to see it disaggregated by absentee type. Um, and I, the reason why I asked for those things is, you know, if you look at it by school, I want to know if it's a sick school. I want to know if it's a culture and climate thing. Um, I want to know what what possible or potential reasons there could I mean, be. And the data is not the same for everybody. No. When you say a sick school, you're talking about a school that is 
mold, um, air quality, air quality um, asbestos, uh, you know, a wide variety of things or things that That's uh, an we've interesting had vernacular, by the way. You see, that rolls off your tongue because you're just so conversant in this stuff. If it's a sick school, I mean, the idea that you refer to a, a school as a sick school is sick. Is sick. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. Um, and and we're we're you know the the average age of buildings in the state is like 65 to 70 years old. Our buildings are you know higher. Our you know my building alone is over 100 years old. So um, we have some really old buildings, and unfortunately, and this is not this is not a, a symptom of this administration or the previous administration. This is uh, um, collateral damage from years and years of kicking the can down the road. Right. right? I'll you know I'll do take a thousand dollar problem and kick it down the, the road, and now it's a five thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand dollar problem. And so now we find ourselves faced with instead of patching a roof, now we need a roof. Instead of you know picking up one tile floor, now we need new floors in every, in every classroom. And so, um, although we, you know, the General Assembly and our own mayor have, have done work to try to get us funding, in terms of our district, in, as you've seen in Newport and other places, it's, it's literally a drop in the bucket. Mm. And so, looking at that, sick school information, so those, those um, well, let me pieces. ask you this. I'm sure. I'm talking, are, do you, are you disputing the general tone of these numbers? Uh, are, are you holding your own rank and file accountable for some of these numbers? So, uh, I want to look at the num Like I said, I want to look more deeply at them. But I, I will not dispute this. I will not dispute the Monday Friday. And I, w I said before, and I'll say it again. I will not excuse the Monday Friday. I, I won't do it. Okay. Um, the the best way that we're going to move this district forward is to have quality teachers in the classroom in front of kids. The way to do that is to have teachers in the classroom. And so um, while there may be on, on some very rare instances, and I can speak to two, where someone would take Fridays off, and that would, issues, be, right? that would be right. a health issue. Right. I, I think I've said that before, yeah. where we've had people who have had chemotherapy on Thursday afternoon yeah. and had to take the Friday off. But other than that, so let me, let me see if I got a summary, because we, we got into some other issues and borrowed the time on the absenteeism. You still are researching this. I am, when but you, I'm not going to excuse you're not gonna, that. But, and that's, I think, a breath of fresh air for the viewers, there's no doubt about that. Um, can we come, have you back in a few weeks after you digest this and talk about it in depth? And, sure. and so we have a better understanding as to what you think about this. Sure. Um, but I think anybody's watching this who watches the teacher union president look you square in the eye and say, I'm not excusing that, I think that sends a, a, a message of confidence uh, to, to folks. I appreciate you being here. Thank and, you. And we'll have you back me. after you take a look at it. Uh, final word when we come back. Stay with us. We'll, uh, we'll reconvene with the teacher union president when she has more time to, to, to look at some of this data. The number of sick days are actually issued. Is a complicated formula. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's not often that we get that kind of frank, pragmatic response to a syndrome that might be in place, which is a Monday, Friday, Let's take a four-day weekend disposition on the part of the teachers. Uh, you must see that as refreshing. I know I do, uh, and constructive. We will review the State of the Union in part tomorrow. Uh, we've got a great guest from the African American Studies uh, Department in Brown to talk about some of the key racial issues that we're dealing with right now, and there are plenty. See you tomorrow.